Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Are you ready for the word of the Lord tonight? Stand to your feet while I get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Father, we haven't come here to hear from a man or woman. We haven't come to hear from an old guy or a young guy, black guy or white guy or brown guy, a gal. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts, our lives. Father, we just thank you for blessing us this night. But we want you also to bless all the churches that are preaching and hearing the gospel tonight all over the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics and Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest of Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center. Thank you for the Assemblies of God, the Four Square Denomination. We thank you for Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist and Ecclesia Church and The Way. We thank you, God, for our Adventist brothers and sisters and Catholic brothers and sisters. At no time, Lord, do we think of ourselves as better than them. Oh, no, we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. And God, may all the praise and glory go to you. And with a great big shout of your glory in your house, we all say, Amen. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord has been on me to bring a message to you for quite some time that I really believe with all my heart that God's going to minister to you and change you and help you and strengthen you. As a pastor, my number one goal in life, my one number one passion in life, my number one desire in life is to see you strong and healthy in your marriages and with your families, when your jobs and your finances, to see you happy and fulfilled in everything you do. It doesn't happen because you just come to church. It happens because you take the time and have the wisdom to get a hold of the Word of God. Understand what it says and apply it in your life. This is the uncompromised word of God. It is the very manual, the handbook on how to do life. If you get a hold of not what I say or what I think, not human philosophies or ideologies, but if you get a hold of the word of the Lord and put it in your heart and apply it to your children and your marriages and your finances, dreams, vision and destiny and purpose in life, it'll change the very existence that you currently live in and give you a place and give you a destiny and give you a purpose in life. And as a pastor, there's nothing I desire more than to see you that way because I love you and more importantly, God loves you. You have got to get a hold of what the word of the Lord has to say. If you don't, you will only live your life according to what you think it ought to be lived like And most likely you will come up very short of what you could have been and could have done in your life. Tonight, I want you to take a few moments of your life and realize that not a man is speaking to you, but God speaking to you. And he brought you in this place and it's a divine appointment with God. As you hear the word of the Lord and start to take it, understand it and apply it in your life. Tonight, a wonderful little subject called integrity or compromise. I find that too many people don't walk and don't understand the word integrity, and they live a compromised life. Compromise is something that will keep you from the very things of God, and God will never join you in a position of compromise. You'll be out there by yourself, and what you wanted to compromise you will eventually lose everything. 
And so many times as we face the world as believers, we compromise who we are and what we stand for. We compromise what we believe, what we know to take place. We compromise even our faith and our trust in God Almighty. Sometimes we compromise just because of what people say and what people do and what people think we ought to be like. We compromise who we really are and who God has made us. And when we do, what it does is it stops God from working on your behalf, taking you to where you need to be and doing what you need to do. And you find at the end of your life frustrated instead of fulfilled. When you could have lived a fulfilled and blessed life in every area, but you had learned over the years to compromise and didn't want to do anything about it, and didn't want to change it. Tonight, I want to encourage you that you cannot live in a world of compromise and flow in the power that God has for you. That you're going to have to live in a world of his integrity, not mine, not yours, but his integrity, and that is an integrity that is void, if you will, of the word compromise. Let me describe to you exactly what I'm talking about. God's word and God's view of integrity, the desire, if you will, and ability to operate in ultimate truth, void of all compromise. When I have a desire and a God-given ability to operate in the ultimate truth. Are you hearing me? You know what the ultimate truth is? It's not what you think. It's not what you say. It's not what politicians tell us. It's not what the political powers that happen to be. It's not what CNN says. It's not what Fox News says. The ultimate truth is what God says. I don't give a flip what anybody says. It's what God says. That's the ultimate truth. And I have a desire and I've got a God-given ability to operate in it and I can do it void of compromise. That's integrity. The world takes the word integrity and they say it's just honesty and it's not. It's a whole lot more. It's absolutely living a life that's void of any kind of compromise. Compromise is when you decide to give up something in order to settle. God hadn't called you to give up something in order to settle. God's not someone that says if you'll just compromise, I'll get involved in it. God is thus saith the Lord God, this is the way it is. Do it no matter what anybody says. Doesn't matter whether it feels good. Doesn't matter whether it looks good. No matter if it acts good. No matter if you think it's good. If God said it, that settles it. You don't have to compromise on it at all. And when we live a life that we start to compromise what God says for us to be like and for what God has us to do, what happens is we lose the very power of God that backs us to help us to do what we need to do in order to be what God's called us to be. And a lot of times when I go and I talk to Christians, I can tell they've got compromised lives. And I don't know about you, but I love you enough to bring it to your attention that we don't have to live, nor do we really want to live a compromised life because we want the very presence of God. And when you live a life that is non-compromising, you will find yourself drawing close to God. And the Bible says he will draw close to you. Man, that's exciting to me. Compromise is what the book of Revelation says. I bet when he comes, and you know he is on the eastern sky splits, he better find you either hot or cold because if he finds you lukewarm, he will vomit you from his mouth. That's compromise when you're lukewarm. And when you're lukewarm, you'll never be anything but a compromised person. You say, Pastor Jim, are you talking about radical Christianity? I don't know anything else but radical Christianity. I read my Bible. And when you read your Bible, you will find out this is not a little here and a little there. A little dab will do you. It is all or nothing. Get in or get out. 
Compromise is living a lukewarm life. And with a lukewarm life, you will never get anything from God. And there's time to make a decision. I'm not going to make that lukewarm life. I'm not going to do these lukewarm things. I'm going to do what God would have me to do. And I'm going to get into where God would have me to get into. It. And it's living that kind of a life that will change the destiny and change the future in your existence. <laughs> May I say this to you? It's when Jesus was speaking in Matthew, the sixth chapter. He says it like this, no one can serve two masters. You will serve the one and hate the other. That's compromise when you think you can serve the world and get involved in the ways of the world and still go to church and still get in with God. Someone needs to tell you that's not good enough with God. Someone needs to tell you you can't live that way. It's going to be all God or it's not going to be God at all. There's no way that God gets involved in compromise. There's no way God looks at you and looks at me and says, you know what, I understand where you're at. It's okay to compromise. After all, I realize what it's like to be a human. It's very difficult time. I'm here to tell you something right now. You cannot serve two masters. You're going to have to make a decision one or the other. It's compromise when Pilate knew who Jesus was and his wife warned him about who Jesus was and not to mess with Jesus. And he lets Barabbas go because he wanted to please the crowd. Why? Because he was a compromiser and he missed God. And you and I can miss God if we're going to be compromisers. But I'm here to tell you I believe in you. I'm here to tell you I think you're great. I'm here to tell you I know you can do it. I'm here to tell you by the voice of the Lord it's a mighty and marvelous and wonderful thing when you serve God with all of your heart and with all of your being. So, come on somebody. Give me a great day. Big amen. Who wants to go to a church that's compromised? That just means you're going to a church that's not going anywhere, not doing anything. Who wants to follow somebody that's not going anywhere? If you follow somebody that's not going anywhere because they're compromised, may I say this to you? You will never go anywhere yourself. We have got to follow somebody who is non-compromising. God said it. That settles it. It's good enough for me and I'll live my life by it. I tell you, this is what God would have for all of us. I want to take you, if I may, in the scripture, 1 Samuel. I want to show you something. It's in the scripture for a reason. It's about the life of Saul. He hadn't yet become king. He's actually a pretty good guy and an innocent guy. He's actually respectful to his parents and respectful to the things of God. But King Saul becomes a greedy person, becomes one who is haunty and becomes one full of pride and couldn't handle the success and ended up horribly failing. But before he got to that place, before he became the first king of Israel, may I say this to you, he's a pretty good guy. It's almost a shame when you read it. It almost brings me to a place of tears. What's taking place in the 11th chapter of 1 Samuel is about compromise. It's there for a reason. It's there so that you and I can look at the word of the Lord and see that God doesn't want us to live a life of compromise. In 1 Samuel, I'm going to read to you starting in verse number 1. In the 11th chapter, it says these words. Then Naash, an Amorite, came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Naash, sounds funny, but listen closely. I want to point it out to you. See, I should have highlighted the words Jabesh Gilead. Naash is an enemy of Israel. It's there for a reason, so you and I can learn about compromise. He's an Amorite. He comes up and he encamps against Jabesh Gilead. Jabesh Gilead is already known for their compromised position. They were asked by the family of Israel to come to battle with them against the enemy, and they said, No. We don't want to fight. We won't want to do anything, just leave us alone. 
we want peace. We're not going to fight with you. And they turn their brothers down to fight against the enemy. So Nahash, this enemy of the camp of Israel, comes along and he comes against them. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, make a covenant with us and we'll serve you. Now we see Jabesh uh, uh, Gilead doing something. They're compromising once again. They're going to the enemy and saying, listen, let's make an agreement. We don't want to fight with you. Let's, ha let's have a, a, an agreement together and we will serve you. Instead of rejecting the enemy, instead of fighting the enemy, instead of resisting the enemy, they came along and said, let's make an agreement together. Most of you in here have made a statement one time or another, and you said it to the devil. Here's what you said. If you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. Can I tell you what his answer will always be? Sure, I'll leave you alone. You know why he says that? Because he's a liar and there's no truth in him. And as soon as you leave him alone, he'll tear you into pieces. I want you to know something. When there is and there will be an enemy that comes against you, you cannot make covenant with him. You cannot compromise your position. They will come after you relentlessly until they get you. That's why the story's there, so that you and I can learn something about compromise. And he makes this statement in verse number two. And he says these words, And Nahash the Amorite answered them, On the condition that I will make a covenant with you, that I put out your right eye and bring a reproach to all of Israel. you got to be kidding me. The enemy comes along and says, I've really got you. I'll make an agreement with you. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to come in and I'm going to pluck out your right eye of every person, every man, every woman, every one of your children. I will gouge out their right eye. I'll tell you what, can I just say something? I'm an old man. But that would tick me off even being an old man. I wouldn't put up with that for a moment, would you? I'd much rather die than have somebody come in and gouge out my right eye. Do you know what the right means all through the scripture? It means God's way. They will never, if the right eyes be gone, they will never be able to see the things of God. That's what it means spiritually. They'll never be able to have a good focus. They'll never be able to accomplish anything. They will look like monsters in the land. They will hate themselves. They will absolutely deplete themselves. They will destroy themselves. All because they compromised. And these idiots are believing they're going to do it. They're so weak. Verse number three comes along and it says, And the elders of Jabesh said to him, to this horrible Nahash, hold off for seven days that we may send a message throughout the territory of Israel. And if there is no one who can save us, then we'll come out to you. In other words, if there's nobody to lead us, you can have our right eye. Can you believe that? This is like so stupid wise in the Bible. The Bible is trying to tell you and I something. You go ahead and keep compromising. The devil's going to come after you. Won't be long before he rips out your right eye and then takes your children and takes your life and takes it all. He's, you might as well understand something. When you became a Christian, you became a fighter. When you became a Christian, there's a war going on. But I got good news for you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I got good news for you. You have the power to run him back, take him down, send him off, and get him out of here and kick his butt to hell. And you can either compromise, hoping you're not going to have a problem and you're going to get whipped just like these guys. Eventually, you're going to get it. He'll stay quiet for a while, but he will come after you. He'll come after your marriage. He'll come after your children. He'll come after your life. He'll come after your spiritually. He'll come after everything. You better stand up and not compromise a thing. These guys are such idiots, they're ready to give in. We will come out to you, which really means we'll give in to you. Verse number four, so they sent a messenger 
to, to uh, Gilead of Saul and told the news and the hearing of the people and all the people lifted up their voices and they wept. You know why they wept? Because there's no leadership. When there's no leadership, people don't know what to do. I don't really believe in leadership. I believe in fellowship. Somebody ought to write a book on fellowship. Because the only real leaders are those that are followers of Jesus. But I use the term leadership because we're all on the same page then and we understand this. Listen, without leadership, they don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. They don't know whether they're given their eye or not given their eye. But when there is leadership, I'm telling you, they'll take the enemy out each time. All of us are called to make sure we've got the right leaders in our lives. The word of God goes on. They're weeping and crying. And there was Saul coming behind the herd from the field. I want you to know something. This is an amazing thing. This Saul, he's with the herd. Samuel has already anointed him as king. He already knows what's going on. He's back with his herd. Pretty cool. And Saul said, what troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul. If you think you're going to defeat the enemy by yourself, you're silly. All you have to know is the Spirit of the Lord is just waiting to come upon you. There's nothing you're going to do by yourself. You're going to do it with God. But there's nothing you're going to let God do by himself. He's got to do it with you. You and God together make the team. And the Spirit of God comes upon Saul. And when he had heard the news, he angered and was greatly aroused. Some of you don't understand when Pastor Jim gets angry. I get angry when you get up and walk out before the church is over with. You better not do that tonight. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim. Hold on. You can be nice about it. Oh, no. Look at what it says. Saul wasn't nice about something that was contrary to the ways of God. I'm not going to be nice about something that's going to be contrary to the ways of God. If you disrespect God and if you're rude enough to walk out of this place before the Spirit of God is finished with you, then get ready. The pastor's going to get down your throat. You say, well, I want you to act like Jesus. I want you to know Jesus even got angry. As long as you don't sin, you're okay. You can have some anger once in a while. It's probably good for you. When the devil rises up against you, you better get angry. He got angry and was greatly aroused. Verse number seven, it says this, and he took a yoke of oxen and he cut them in pieces and sent them throughout the land of the territory of Israel by the hands of messengers saying, whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be to his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell upon the people and they came out with one consent. No longer are they compromising anymore. Now they're united to do something. And I want you to know something. When we're together, we can get the job done. We need each other. I want you to go with me, if you will, into 2 Corinthians. Save your place right there in 1 Samuel, the 11th chapter, because we're going to be coming back there. But I want you to go with me into the New Testament in 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. Is anybody listening tonight? In 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. Do not, verse number 14. Here's compromise. Watch this. Tell me if some of you have been this way, and if you are, you need to repent. Tonight's your night. God brought you here for a reason. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? 
That's called compromise. And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord is Christ with Baal? Or what part is a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will, listen to the promise, and I will, listen to the promise, and I will, what happens when there's no compromise, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. How'd you like to have dad who created the heavens and the earth? Some of you much rather have a rich father on the earth. I'm going to tell you something. There's no more wealthier one than the one in the heavens. And I'll be a father. And the Bible goes on and says it's the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. But he better be your father. You're not going to get the kingdom. It's called compromise. And sometimes we live a life that's compromised all the time. I know from my own life, many times there's things in my home, in my family, with my children that we had to make decisions about. We were not going to compromise with our kids. We were not going to compromise with our love towards each other. We were not going to watch something that was going to pollute Deborah and pollute me. I was not going to partake of something. Man, I want you to hear what I'm going to say to you. I love drinking. Booze. I love smoking. Cigarettes. Pipes. Even cigars. But I'm not compromising. I'm not doing it because it's not only bad for me, it'd be bad for you to see me drinking. Because that'd give you an excuse to drink. And you don't have that excuse in this place. One time. Uh Uh-oh, Debbie said, here we go. One time. A friend of mine was a missionary in Cuba sent Debbie and I some cigars from Cuba. (laughs) We happened to be on vacation in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. We figured nobody would see us there. True story. The woman could hardly wait to get to her cigar. She popped that thing in. Lit it up like a pro. I popped mine in and lit it up like a pro. Took one drag and the both of us turned green. It had been 20 years since either one of us had smoked a cigarette or anything. You can drink if you want, but it's just bad for me. When Deborah and I got married, we used to drink a little wine. The woman <laughs> burned everything for dinner. One glass of wine and she's out of it. Cheap date. (laughs) One glass. I'd get food. You know when I knew when dinner was ready when the fire alarm went off inside that kitchen. (laughs) We weren't pastoring in those days. We're business people. I finally sat down with her. I said, girl, let's talk. I haven't had a meal in three days and you're drunk.
I think we ought to make a covenant with God. That was 34 years ago. We said, you can do what you want to do. That's your business. But for us, we don't touch nothing. And the reason for it is because we're no good when we compromise. Oh, but we're good when we're not compromised. The woman knows how to cook. I'm talking good food. And if she doesn't cook good, she knows where to go get it. You know, you, girls know what I'm talking about? El Poil Loco or whatever. I don't know what those words mean. I think it means your husband's crazy for eating this. I'm talking good. She knows how to cook. Compromise will ruin your meals. Destroy your children. Ruin your marriage. Ruin your morals. Ruin your commitment to Christ. Compromise is a horrible thing. It's something that you're, you do, but you know it's keeping you from the best. Go back with me in the first Samuel. This time in 1 Samuel, let's take a look at the results of a non-compromised group of people who decided not to let this Nahash character pluck out their eyes, but to fight them. In the 11th chapter, verse number 11, all the men of Israel are gathered together. They're non-compromising. They're together now resisting the enemy. May I say this to you? Listen to me. They can't lose. Impossible to lose. Because God's on their side. And when you're non-compromising, God's on your side. You can't lose. The only way you lose is when you compromise. Verse number 11, so it was on the next day that Saul put the people in three companies and they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch and killed the Amorites until the heat of the day. And it happened that those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. Victory comes to a people who are non-compromising, not afraid of a fight, and will stick together. And as long as we're together, we win. When we get together and compromise, God's gone and we'll lose. Are you following me? And today, tonight, you and I have got to make a commitment that we're in this for the long haul. And that commitment is we're non I don't care what people think. I don't care what nahashes are that are coming against me. I don't care who wants to control me and lie to me, take from me and cheat of me. I don't care what the politicians say, the Republicans or Democrats are the pedestrians. I only care about what God says. God says it, I believe it, that settles it, and that's the way it is, and we have got the victory. It's your call, because you will always be challenged to compromise. Always be challenged to compromise. And when you compromise, you're in it alone from that point on. And now your right eye is vulnerable. And it's your call, not mine. It's yours. If you compromise and you fall 
at least fall forward, get back to church, let us pick you up and love you, and let's teach you how to fight the good fight of faith and win the battle. Come on, somebody. I'm finished. If God spoke to you tonight, give the Lord a great big praise. Will you do that? God is so good. Now, before you go tonight, I want to make sure everybody's all right with God. Now, stop and think about it just for a moment. We've come into the house of God, and we've had a good time. We sang. We loved the Lord. We clapped our hands. You heard the word of God tonight. You were great listening to the word of God. How sad it would be if you walked out of this building, your heart stopped, and you died and you open your eyes and you're in hell. I want to make sure if you die, you're not going to hell. And I want to ask you this question. I want every single person in here to answer this question. Nobody move. Nobody disturb anybody else. Nobody get up. Stay seated. Family rooms, you're packed. This one isn't as packed as this one. I want to talk to you just for a moment. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. All across this place, I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. Nobody will know but you and God. Here's the question. If you were to walk out of this building and your heart stopped, bang, and you died, would you go to hell or would you go to heaven? Answer the question because guess what? The Bible says your answer to that question says where you're really at with God. Would you go to hell or would you go to heaven? Let's talk about your answer because it says where you're at. Some of you said, well, Pastor Jim, I, I think that if I died, I think I'd go to heaven. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can think your way into heaven like whoever's the most positive thinker gets to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Some of you might say, well, Pastor Jim, I, if I died, I hope I'd go to heaven. I just hope I'd make it. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to hope your way into heaven. Like whoever hopes the most gets to go to heaven, you're not going to make it. And somebody needs to tell you before it's too late. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. I love God a whole lot. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God a whole lot. Can I tell you something? Guess what? Those guys that stole the airplanes and crashed them in the World Trade Center, they love God too. They said, Allah, we love you. According to my Bible, it's the wrong God and it's the wrong way to show love. They're in hell and took a lot of people with them. My goodness sakes alive. There's nowhere in the Bible that says you can go to heaven because you say you love God. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to tell you. Some of you that are in here tonight, you need to hear what I'm going to say to you. You're saying to me, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. My mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. Well, they took me to catechism class and Sunday school class and Sabbath school class. Put a cross or a St. Christopher around my neck when I was a child. I've always thought of myself as a Christian. I'm glad, could you show me that in the scripture? Because it's not in the Bible that says your mom and dad can tell you you're a Christian, have your Christian or baptized as a baby, put religious jewelry on you, take you to those classes and make you Christians. Not in the Bible, you're not going to make it. Somebody needs to love you enough to tell you the truth. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, hold on, I joined my last church. I sang in the choir for 25 years or 15 years or 10 years. I was a leader in the church. I, I taught Sunday school. I counted the offering. I helped the pastor out. It was a Christian church. I was there for years. Could you show me where you joined the church, sing in the choir, help the pastor teach Sunday school? You get to go to heaven? Could you show me? Because it's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to tell you you're not going to make it. You say, Pastor Jim, hold on. Wait a minute, Pastor Jim. I'm really a good person. I'm going to go to heaven because I'm really good. Someone told me if I'm good enough, I'll make it. You know, the law's not chasing me. I haven't robbed the, the local 7-Eleven store for at least three years. We're in San Bernardino, so that's good. <laughs> I'm a pretty good person. Doesn't that count for something? No. Nowhere in the Bible says if you're good enough, you get to go to heaven. Nowhere. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it, and somebody needs to tell you. 
Let me tell you something what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't make it any other way but his way. You can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven my way. We can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. We're going to have to get to heaven God's way. And God tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. In John 3rd chapter, he says these words, you must be born again. Now, I know what you're thinking about born again. Hollywood's made born again. People look like idiots and fanaticals and radicals and crazy people. But I'm not talking about that. You must be born again means this. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, because most people that attend American churches don't even know what it really means. But here's what it means. I'll tell you what it means. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it means you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been. It always will be. I'll prove it to you by the scripture itself. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus himself is speaking. I quoted it earlier. He said, I'm coming again, and don't you know he is, and he might even be tonight, and you don't want to miss it. He said, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really said? Here's what he really just said. Lukewarm people that call themselves Christians are not real Christians at all, even though they call themselves Christians. They're not going to make it. Let me define for you what lukewarm is. Lukewarm is a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance. Lukewarm. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Here's what lukewarm is. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And until you make him everything, he will never be something. And only you can do that by giving him all of your heart and giving him all of your life. It's your call. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus himself made the statement, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. When you hear the sound, bang, that's what it'll sound like. I'll go one, two, three, bang, and you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. I'll see it. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I do not want Jesus just in my head. You see, because I already know you know who he is in your head or you wouldn't be here. You celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of your life. You already know who he is. There's no doubt about it, but you can't get to heaven with head knowledge. It's not about what you have in your head. It's about what you've been. Watch this, watch this, watch this. It's about what you've done with your heart. And you're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. Why do I say give? Because he's not a thief to rob it from you. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it. He's not a manipulator. After all, it's your heart. It's your call with what you do with it. Do you want to give it to him or not? Do you want to go to heaven or don't you? It's your call. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, hold on. You want me to raise my hand? Yeah, go ahead. We'll do it all at the same time. You can put your hand down right now. Hands are already going up all over the place. Listen closely. You say, Pastor Jim, you want me to raise my hand? I'll be embarrassed if I raise my hand. Uh Uh-huh, you might be. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever, ever and ever, ever and ever and ever and ever because you're more afraid of what people think instead of what God sees. Tonight, God has brought you here and you have a divine appointment with God. Tonight is your anointed time with God. This is your call. This is your time. God brought you here. You've had a lot of appointments in your life with plumbers and painters and doctors and, and attorneys, but tonight you've got one with God. Don't miss it. Tonight is your night to give God all of your heart. Tonight is your night to give God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship and only you can make the choice and the call to give it to him. I'm going to count to three who should raise their hand. If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. 
If you're in this place and you've never given to me, if you're not sure, maybe you prayed with Billy Graham or you prayed at a Harvest Crusade, that's great. But guess what? Did you follow the prayer up with all of your heart and all of your life? Or was it just a little magical formula that you repeated that someone else told you to say and you called it a prayer? Don't treat God like he's stupid. God doesn't just hear the words. He watches your life that follows your heart. And if you haven't really given him all of your heart, you will never have the life that proves that you've given him all of your heart. Tonight is your night of salvation. I'm counting to three. Are you ready? Get ready. All at the same time, get ready to pop your hand up and put it right back down. There's hands already getting ready. Let's do it at the same time. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, Three, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, thank you, five, thank you, six, thank you, seven, thank you. There's eight, nine, ten, thank you, eleven, back over here. God bless you. Come on, let me see your hands. Anybody else? Eleven, there's twelve, there's thirteen, thank you, God bless you. Anybody on this side, back in this family room? Anybody else? There's fourteen, thank you, there's fifteen, God bless you. I see them, I already got them. Anybody else, real quick? There's another person, they're pointing this way. Fifteen over this way on the other side. There's 15 or 16, thank you, God bless you. Anybody else? There's 16 wise people. Come on, anybody else? There's 17 right there. There's, uh, there's two hands up there. Say, you really want to get God. Good for you, man. There, uh, do I get to count you twice? Uh, there's 18, there's 19, thank you. Come on, if there's 19, there's 20 in this place. Where are you? Where are you, 20? You're sitting there saying, I wish this big mouth old man preacher would shut up. Guess what? I'm not shutting up for you. Today is your day of salvation. Get your hand up. I'm fighting for you. Anybody else? There's 20 right there. God bless you. 21, thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Don't clap. When you clap, you're scaring my fish away. There's 22. I'm fishing. You don't go to the lake and throw rocks in while you're fishing. Anybody else? There's 23. You're pointing over here somewhere. Where are you? There you are. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's 23. There's 24. Why don't you do it all at once? There's 24. I feel like I'm selling knives at the county fair. Just get your hands up. There's 24. Thank you. God bless you. If there's 24, don't you know there's 25? Where are you, 25? You're saying to yourself, I want the guy to shut up. I think I already counted you. Did, did you just put it up just now? Okay, there's, there's another one back here. Maybe 26. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Because you're going to miss this if you don't get your hand up. And you're compromised. And you can't expect God to do great things. Let's get out of compromise and get into God. There's 26 of you. Is there 27? Real quick. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 27. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? I don't want anybody to leave. When you leave, it's rude. I'll let you go in a few minutes. All 27 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Get out of your seat. I want you to get in the aisle, bring your stuff, all 27 of you, and get up here and meet me right here. Come on, you come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Because Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Come on, stand and welcome them as they come. You raise your hand, get down here. Every breath that I take, every moment. My heart, I'll give you my soul, and I'll live for you alone. Come on, come on, come on, every come on. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. God, so cool. Okay, you guys, real quick, all of you up front, put a smile on your face. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. You're not going to the morgue tonight. You get to go to heaven. So put a smile on your face. Look over here. See this guy waving at you. His name's Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. He's going to do three things. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. 
Jesus doesn't come into your heart because you need him. He went to the cross for you because you need him. He comes into your heart because you invite him in. Second thing, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature. Only takes a few moments about now that you're a Christian, what to do next. Number three, he's going to introduce you to a program we have to help you get strong called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You need an SPT. They're your friends. They'll call you during the week, encourage you, buy you coffee, tea, nachos, meet with you before church service, go over some scripture with you, and just encourage you until you get strong. You need that. Let us help you get strong in Jesus. After all, you said you're going to give God all of your heart. You said you're going to give God all of your life. Let us help you to do that. Only takes a few moments, the people you came with. I want you just to make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.